And a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. Turning over to Psalm 27, and beginning at verse 4, King David says, One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Jump down and we'll just finish at verse 8. David says to the Lord, When you said, Seek my face, my heart said to you, Your face, Lord, I will seek. In these passages, the Holy Spirit is showing us the hearts of two people who were consumed with love for Jesus, who pursued his presence with intensity. And I want to share with you this morning about this topic, becoming a person of one thing, becoming a person of one thing. Let's pray and let's invite the Holy Spirit to come and minister life to us this morning from his word. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the gift of your word. It is truly a lamp for our feet, and it is the light for our pathway. Jesus said that the word of God is like seed. So, Father, we give you our hearts in this time, and we ask that you would make them to be good soil, soil that can receive and retain and bear fruit from the seed of the word of God. Jesus said that the words he speaks to us are spirit, and they are life. So, Father, minister life to us now from the scriptures. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And amen. Well, I want to wish you all a very happy Valentine's Day. We just held here at the church the XO Marriage Conference simulcast, and it was a great hit. We're believing that God will touch marriages here at Harvest Time, and we hope that many couples and singles alike were able to gain wisdom that will help them in the future. Whenever I get to preach at this time of year, I always like to share some wisdom from the greatest experts on love, our kids. And this Valentine's Day, I did some research and I found some fresh insights on love from children. And I hope that their wisdom will help you in some small way. Kids were asked a series of questions about love. And these were their responses. In response to the question, how do you decide who to marry? Alan, aged 10, said, you got to find somebody who likes the same stuff. (laughs) Like, if you like sports, she should like it that you like sports, and she should keep the chips and dip coming. (laughs) What is the right age to get married? Camille, 10 years old, said, 23 is the best age because you know the person forever by then. (laughs) How can you tell if two people are married? Eight-year-old Derek said, you might have to guess based on whether they seem to be yelling at the same kids. (laughs) What do your mom and dad have in common? Eight-year-old Lori answered, They both don't want any more kids. (laughs) What do you do when a first date is going bad? Nine-year-old Craig says, I would run home and play dead. (laughs) And the next day, he says, I will call all the newspapers and make sure they wrote about me in all the dead columns. (laughs) When is it okay to kiss somebody? Pam, age seven, said, when they're rich. (laughs) How would the world be different if people didn't get married? Kelvin, eight-year-old boy, said, there sure would be a lot of kids to explain, wouldn't there? (laughs) How do you make your marriage work? 
10-year-old Ricky has learned the secret, apparently. I'm not sure if Ricky's going to have a good life or a bad life. Ricky said, tell your wife she looks pretty, even if she looks like a truck. (laughs) And finally this, how do people act when they're in love? Christine, age nine, has real wisdom for us. She said, It's love if they order one of those desserts that are on fire. They like to order those because it's just like how their hearts are on fire. True love, real love, is on fire. It has a flaming intensity to it. Today we've read about Mary of Bethany and King David Two people with a burning love for God. They had an unquenchable desire for him, and so they refused to be hindered in their pursuit. David and Mary were people of one thing. Jesus said one thing was necessary. Everybody say one thing. One thing. And Mary chose to pursue it. Last week, we began our series as pastor shared Jesus, our magnificent obsession based on the book, Magnificent Obsession. And we're going to be sharing for a few weeks about being captivated by devotion for Jesus. Last week, Pastor Glenn spoke about the greatest question in all of life. It's Jesus' question to us, who do you say that I am? Jesus is asking every one of us that question and how we answer it will set the course of our lives and determine the quality of our days. Pastor Mike Bickle says, Our thoughts of Jesus are too few and too low. A low view of Jesus keeps believers in bondage with a dull spirit and trapped in spiritual boredom. Our answer determines whether or not we will run to him in our weakness, sin, and boredom and pursue our life's purpose. Who is Jesus? We believe here that he's the son of God. He's the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He's the son of righteousness, risen with healing in his wings. He's the Messiah, king of Israel, and he's the light of the world. I wonder if anybody believes that. Who is Jesus? The apostle John saw his glory and said, his name is called the word of God. And he has written on his robe a name, king of kings and lord of lords. He's the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. And God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name so that at Jesus' name, every knee must bow. Jesus Christ is Lord. But not only do I want my heart to praise him, I want my heart to say what Solomon said about him. Yes, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved and this is my friend. Our prayer is that you will not only understand who Jesus is, but that you will find him to be, as we often sing, altogether lovely. That you'll see him as majestic and beautiful, the most appealing person you could ever know, someone who is worthy of pursuing with all your strength. Let's explore together now what it means to be a person of one thing. There are three important questions we need to dig into in order to learn what that means and how to walk in it. Three important questions to help us understand what it means to be a person of one thing. And the first one is this. What is God looking for? What is God looking for? I suppose that question may strike some of us as a little odd. Most of us can relate to the idea of people looking for God, but what exactly could God be looking for? As strange as it may sound to you, the Bible tells us that God is looking for you. Maybe you're here this morning and you're already a believer in the Lord Jesus, and so you're thinking, well, thank God he already did find me. But what if even though God found you already, he was still looking for you? What if God is looking to draw closer to you, 
And what if God is still waiting to see if you want to draw closer to him? In verse 8 of Psalm 27, where we read, David said, When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, O Lord, I will seek. David reveals that God is saying to you and me, seek my face. The Lord is looking for fellowship with people who will seek his face, not merely the blessings that he graciously bestows to us. He's calling out to us to see if we will turn aside from our many pursuits and be attracted to his glory. He wants to see if we will pursue relationship with him and not merely the rewards of knowing him. Of course, strictly speaking, don't misunderstand me. We know that God doesn't need anything. He's never needed anything. And contrary to what you might have heard well-meaning people say a time or two, God did not make us because he was lonely. God has always been complete in himself. And yet Jesus said that God really is looking for something. Jesus said the hour is coming and now is here already when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth because the Father is seeking people like that to worship him. God is looking for worshipers, people who are hungry to know him more and to know him better. Jesus came to Martha's house that day looking for hospitality. This is a picture of how he comes to our homes, to our hearts, looking to see if we are eager to receive him, not just as a savior or as a deliverer from troubles, but as a friend and a companion for every day. At Christmas time, we sing about this idea. We sing, let every heart prepare him room. You see, Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. Now that's a verse you may know that we often use in evangelism. But in reality, it's actually a verse that Jesus spoke to a church as he was waiting to see if that church was hungry for his presence. What is God looking for? God is looking for people who will open the door of their hearts to him. I believe that God is eager to bless hungry people who will seek him with their whole heart. The Bible says that the eyes of the Lord run. They are running to and fro across the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. That's what God is looking for. And so hopefully that means that we are what God is looking for. Three important questions we're exploring that can teach us what it means to be a person of one thing. The first is, what is God looking for? The second question is this, what am I looking for? What am I looking for? See, when I consider what God is looking for, it makes me wonder, can my heart compel God to take notice of me and take notice of my worship? Does my passion for him cause me to stand out? If the eyes of the Lord are searching for loyal hearts, can God see that my heart is growing today more fiery with passion for him? God isn't looking for moral perfection when he looks at the human race because he knows that he won't find it. But surely he's looking for hearts that are moving in his direction. Surely he's looking to see if I am growing more fervent in my love for the Son of God. Surely he wants to see if I am pushing aside some of the comforts of this life so that I can pursue him more zealously. When I consider what God is looking for, it makes me wonder sometimes whether God's first commandment is my first commandment. Do you remember that Jesus said the greatest, the first and greatest commandment of all is that we love the Lord our God with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. David had a wonderful testimony with God because of what he was looking for. You remember what God said about David. He said, I have found a man after my own heart. 
Church, wouldn't we love to have God say the same thing about you and me? Wouldn't it hurt us to, on occasion, think about what our reputation might be at the throne? What is my worship reputation in heaven? If you can't say amen, say oh my. God said, I have found David, a man after my own heart. But what, I wonder, is heaven's estimation of my heart? What is heaven's opinion of my level of zeal? If we want to be people after God's own heart, we need to ask, how did David achieve that reputation? How did David become God's most famous worshiper in the scriptures? Well, I find that in Psalm 27, David gave away all of his secrets. It turns out that David agreed with Jesus. He said, you need to be a person of one thing. In verse four, he says, one thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. And that one thing needs to be the thing that you desire from God. And it needs to be the thing that we seek after or pursue. What was David pursuing? First, I really don't know how to say it any other way than to simply say that David just wanted God. David said that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. David wanted to live in God's presence. We need to do the same. Now, that doesn't mean that we're going to shirk all of our responsibilities and uh, move up here to the church and live here in the church. Don't do that. It gets a little bit chilly in the sanctuary at night. David had responsibilities. He was running a nation. He had great responsibilities. But I think what David did mean was that he was passionately pursuing God's presence. And everything in his life revolved around his love for God. The one thing he asked God for, the thing that he sought was to live in God's presence every day. That was his one thing. David also wanted to see the beauty of the Lord, or literally, it means the delightfulness of the Lord. He wanted to see more facets of God's beautiful character. David had come to know that God was the most inviting, the most appealing person in the universe. Throughout a life spent following God and studying God's word, David had come to know that God really is altogether lovely. He realized that it was completely worth it for him to expend himself in getting to know God better and seeing more and more facets of the excellency of this God. He wanted to be like the seraphim angels, the one who gaze at God's presence in heaven continually, crying out constantly, holy, holy, holy. Every moment those angels catch a fresh revelation of how majestic this God is, and so they never cease to proclaim the holiness, the glory of God. And I believe that David knew that it was worth it to become completely captivated by that glory that never stops unfolding itself. It was David's one thing. David said he wanted to inquire in God's temple. That's a wonderful Hebrew word, inquire, that means to seek something out. It's used in Ezekiel when God says that he is searching for his sheep like a shepherd. David could seek out some things there in God's presence because that's the only place where we can find certain things. How many of you know that there are some things we will only be able to find in the presence of God? And David knew that he could find in God's presence revelation from God's word. He could find wisdom as to how to live a godly life. He could find, he could discover and uncover the will of God for his life. That word inquire also means, most literally in Hebrew, it means to plow. See, while David was gazing at God's beauty, he wanted to plow. He wanted to dig into those things. David was saying, I am digging into the hidden mysteries, the hidden treasures of God, the things that I will only be able to find in God's presence. Church, can I tell you that God is hiding 
many wonderful treasures from us. You maybe never heard anybody say that from a pulpit. Let me say that again. God is hiding many wonderful treasures from us, not because he wants to keep them from us, but so that we will seek them from him. Amen. He wants us to find these amazing treasures, but they can only be found at his feet and before his face. Yes. David's motivation in life was to find and to rest within that presence. That was the one thing that he sought from God. Now, many of you would know that a few years later, God would commend David's son Solomon for seeking wisdom. Solomon said, wisdom is the principal thing. So with all the acquiring that you do in life, make sure you acquire wisdom. But church, I believe that David's desire, his one thing was greater than the one thing that Solomon asked for, as good as it was. It's what made David a man after God's own heart. Could that be why, I wonder, why David never really backslid the way that Solomon did in spite of all the wisdom that Solomon possessed? That's a whole other sermon right there, but not going to give that sermon to you. I'm preaching that one at the 2 p.m. sermon, so <laughs> you come back then and talk about that. David was a person of one thing, and the one prize he wanted most was God himself. In the New Testament, lovers of Jesus were on the same quest. It drove the apostle Paul, even though Paul had already known Jesus for decades, Paul said, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count, I count them as rubbish, so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, so that I may know him. And this was the apostle's example that we should keep on pursuing and keep on loving Jesus increasingly as time goes by in our lives. Well, that was David's pursuit and Paul's, but what about me? Am I being pulled in so many directions that it's hard to keep my love for him steady, much less growing? We live in a day of distractions. I don't know if you caught it, but a couple weeks ago, they announced that our attention span has dropped from a lousy 12 seconds down to just a measly eight seconds. In other words, you only have eight minutes to get, I'm sorry, eight seconds to get somebody's attention before their mind gets pulled away to another image, to another Facebook notification, to another text chiming in, some other notification or what have you. Now, eight seconds doesn't sound that bad until you learn that the attention span of a goldfish is nine seconds. So congratulations, we all now have less focus than a goldfish. Turn to your neighbor and say, what did he just say? <laughs> so church, in this distracted world, do I have any time to meditate upon God and pray? See, the world delights in keeping my mind traveling all day long without a break, without ever letting me get off the off-ramp so that I can seek the lover of my soul. Our constant connectedness has become an addictive and harmful drug. Entertainment overload and social media addiction ironically decreases the quality of our relationships. And it robs us of the time that we need to inquire in his temple. May the Lord turn our gaze to his face once more and help us point our eyes toward his loveliness. He is altogether lovely and finding him will satisfy my heart in a way that no human entertainment could ever do. The more that I look upon Jesus, the more entranced I become by his beauty and the more I will love him. Jesus is the only healthy addiction. Jesus is the only obsession that actually ministers life to a man instead of robbing life from us. God is looking for worshipers and lovers, but what am I looking for? I pray that I will always be looking for him in return. 
Three important questions that help us understand what it means to be a person of one thing. What is God looking for? Second, what am I looking for? And finally this, how can I become a person of one thing? How can I become a person of one thing? Because church, this needs to be our goal. That we would pursue Jesus with a focused intensity and a love that doesn't taper off or fizzle out as time goes by. That we would go from glory to glory. We love to quote that. And isn't that what God has promised us? But are we doing it? We need to reap the benefits of a life that daily invites his presence into what we're doing. How can we do it? We looked at Psalm 27, but see here that Jesus also has lessons for us from the story of Mary of Bethany that I believe will help us to pursue him in a distracted world. Let's look quickly at the story of Mary and see how we can obtain what Jesus called the good part, something that nobody can take away from us. In verse 39 of Luke 10, we read that Martha had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. There are four keys here that made Mary a woman of one thing, and I'm going to share them with you quickly as we get ready to close. First, Luke tells us that Mary sat. Mary sat. See, Mary had to step away from what she was doing and create a break, create a space in her day when she could draw near to Jesus. And we need to do the same. We can read elsewhere in the world that David did the same thing. The Bible says that David sat before the Lord. And we need to make space in our lives for the pursuit of God's presence to behold his beauty and to inquire in his temple. Many people complain, and I know you've probably heard people say many times that they just don't have enough time. Or they tell us that they become frustrated in their Christian life because it seems that they're only able to give God the tail end of their day. Can I suggest that one thing that may be helpful to you is to schedule your appointment with God on your calendar. Take out your phone, take out your paper, paper calendar and schedule that appointment with God the way that you would schedule any other appointment. Let it become one more important appointment that you would never break. Try to begin your day with God and end your day with God. If you can, get away for a, just a few minutes during the day and take a break with Jesus. You know, that was King David's practice. David said, seven times a day do I praise you. Let your family know, moms and dads, and let your kids know too, that this is your appointment with God and don't be embarrassed about it. You know, it will be a good thing for your kids to see that you have alone time with God. Amen. Amen? Now, I know everybody, we've invented lately this concept of me time, right? You can't talk to me because this is me time. <laughs> Bring me those chips and dip that the kid was talking about and leave me alone because it's me time. But you know what? It will be a good thing for your kids to see that you have alone time with God and that it's important for you and they see that it's important for you to step away and seek his face. And don't feel awkward about it either. I'll tell you this, if you don't feel awkward about it, neither will they. See, your example of worship and seeking Jesus may be King David. Your example may be Mary of Bethany. But guess what, Mom, Dad? You are their example. Ask the Lord to make you sensitive to the voice of his spirit. Mary knew that it was a special occasion when Jesus came, so she adjusted her schedule and her priorities. We need sensitivity from the Lord to know when he might be pulling us aside for a special season of seeking him. A second key for Mary of Bethany is where she sat, at Jesus' feet. This tells us that our time with Jesus must be focused on him. We're not just taking time to be quiet or to clear our heads. We're going to his feet, and that's the place 
of worship, the place of prayer. These need to be times of what the Bible calls sowing to the spirit. We're making time to run after God's presence because nothing less, nothing else will make a lasting impact in my heart. This Greek word that Luke uses for Mary sitting is used only one time in the entire Bible. And it's a word that means she was sitting at his feet, but also sitting alongside him. It tells me that she was wanting to nestle up to Jesus and just get as close to him as she possibly could so she could hang on every word that he was saying. A third key we see in Mary's pursuit of Jesus is that she listened. Luke said she heard his word. Now, this may be the hardest part. It takes time for our busy minds to settle down and give focused attention to what Jesus is saying to us. Pastor Glenn and I have a friend who says that when you get down on your knees to pray, you have to wait for the train to go by. You know what I'm talking about? Not only must we break away to be with Jesus, but just like Mary did, we must harness our minds to listen to him. Distractions of media must be put aside for a little while. You know, we just, a couple of weeks ago, we had wrapped up a time of fasting as a church, but maybe some of us need to take a fast from media and break the power of entertainment addictions and other voices that make it hard to quiet our spirits before the Lord. Our ears must be fully attentive to his voice. A final key that we can pick up from Mary's pursuit of Jesus is that she listened to his word. In our times of seeking God, we not only need to have an attentive heart, but we need to turn our attention towards his word. To become a people of one thing, in order to have a singular focus on pursuing Christ, our times with him must become about the food that he is giving to us. I have nothing against devotionals. I've even written one or two. I have stacks of Christian books. Trust me. I walk about in fear because someday I just know I'm going to drive home from church and when I get into the driveway, driveway, my wife will have ratted me out. I'm going to see that truck and the camera crew from the TV show Hoarders is going to be in my driveway. My poor wife. So listen, church, books are great. But when it comes to sitting at the feet of Jesus, I need to listen to his word. Only his word can build me up. Paul said only the word of God can give me the inheritance that God wants to lead me into. Only the word of God can fuel my passion for Jesus so that it's something that continues to grow year by year instead of dying out. Only the pure word of God can cleanse my heart as I gaze into it and help me to resemble more and more the likeness of the Son of God. Jesus said, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. So it is his words that we need. Let's learn from Mary of Bethany. Let's quiet our hearts and seek him in prayer and in the word. In our book, Magnificent Obsession, Brian Kim says we need to cultivate what he calls a beholding heart, a heart that pursues beholding him. He says the way we behold him on this side of eternity is by taking time to focus our attention on him in diligent prayer and in the study of his word. Mary had found the most beneficial thing for her fulfillment, for the fulfillment of her soul as a human being. She was attracted to this majestic Lord. And so she made the best choice and would not be denied. That's what Jesus said in verse 42. But one thing is needed and Mary has chosen the good part that will not be taken away from her. Again, Brian Kim says the choice to stop to listen, to hear his word, to spend hours in prayer, to build a history of loving relationship with Jesus. That choice will carry on with you forever. The history you've made with God will last. Now, we know, don't we, that there will always be distractions in our quest. How many of you know life is always throwing surprises and curveballs at us? 
And there will probably always be a Martha nearby who thinks that your pursuit is irresponsible or that it's just not the right time for it. Can I tell you that sometimes you and I actually are Martha in the story. We feel the weight of our responsibilities. And when we do, we rob ourselves of the best part of what is happening in the room. Part of me can't blame Martha. She acted the way that we're supposed to act when we have something important to do. By the way, I wanted to point out that this painting uh, captures exactly what I mentioned to you a moment ago, what Luke was describing in Greek, the way that he said Mary was sitting. So she's sitting at his feet, but she's alongside of him as close as she can be. That's exactly what it looks like. That painter nailed it. And part of me can't blame Martha, but what a beautiful moment, what a beautiful opportunity she missed just by overcomplicating lunch. It revealed some warning signs in her heart. She was worried, Jesus said, and troubled about many things, and maybe you are also. That particular day, I don't think that Martha went to Jesus for peace in her struggles. Many Bible commentators think that Martha was a widow because Luke gives us the detail that Martha actually owned her house herself. She didn't have an easy life, and to top things off, her little sister was leaving her holding the hummus. So Mary had to be responsible. It's very interesting. In Aramaic, the ancient language that was spoken by Jesus and his friends, in Aramaic, Martha's name means, actually means mistress of the house. It means lady. It's the, the female version in Aramaic of the word Lord. So poor Martha, even her name was teasing her and provoking her, literally telling her by her own name that she had to play the role of the boss lady. And so her inability to relax and enjoy Jesus' presence was making her frustrated. And look where that lack of peace can take us. In verse 40, Luke says, she approached him and said, Lord, don't you care? that my sister has left me to serve alone. Therefore, tell her to help me. Notice what was happening to Martha's heart. First, I don't know if you've ever seen this in this story, she interrupted Jesus. How many of you know that sometimes our selfishness can hinder others from receiving what God is doing in the room? And as a friend of mine once said, that's good preaching right there. Second, Martha accused the Lord of not caring about what she was going through. Yikes. Third, Martha lived up to her name that meant boss lady, and she told Jesus what he needed to do to straighten out Mary. And church, let's all be careful here because in our frustrations, we can end up resenting our fellow servants, and then turning around and telling God what he needs to do to straighten them out. We become like Martha when we let our busyness justify, get this, when we allow our busyness to justify our failure to pursue Jesus. If you're stressed out today, friends, don't let your frustrations warp the way that you look at other believers or how you look at God. It may be time, truthfully, to take off that apron for a couple of minutes and be refreshed like Mary in the presence of Jesus. I know the dishes are not going to wash themselves, but it's okay. Guess what? They'll be waiting for you later. (laughs) But church, listen, when Jesus comes to your house, When Jesus draws near to your heart, speaking his words of life, the most responsible thing you can do is break away, sit at his feet, and listen to his words of life. Worship team, you can come back, please, and help us if you would. So in conclusion, church, I want to challenge you today 
Let's live like David. Let's desire one thing from the Lord and pursue it. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. And I want to challenge us also to live like Mary of Bethany. Choose the good part. Something that you can never lose and contend for that choice in your life. Brian Kim says it this way, when Jesus said one thing is needed, he wasn't kidding. Choose this simple way, fight to choose it above all else and watch Jesus vindicate your choice time after time. You know, I believe that this is exactly the remedy that many of us are looking for in an overly busy society. Lives without purpose can become lives full of meaning when we begin to pursue the Son of God. David had said in another place, many of you will know this passage in Psalm 16, where David said, in your presence, there is fullness of joy. And at your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. And millions have known and have discovered what some of us can rediscover today, that seeking Jesus Christ with a burning love is the greatest adventure that human beings can ever experience. That was Paul's great pursuit in prayer. He prayed that we would know the love of Christ that is going beyond knowledge so that we might be filled up with all the fullness of God. Church, will you respond to Jesus' call to seek his face and to let him in? I believe that Jesus is still standing outside the door of our church, the door of our homes, the doors of our hearts. And today, he is still saying, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and I will have fellowship with him and he will have fellowship with me. Just like Mary of Bethany did, can we welcome him into our hearts today and hear his words of life? Let's become a people of one thing. Come on, will you stand with me? And let's give Jesus praise in his house this morning. Come on, give Jesus a great hand of praise.